begin at an incredible weird place. Uh, I'm going to kind of go back and talk to you about John as a whole. Um, and um, uh, there are generally scholars um, divide the Gospel of John into two parts. The first part is chapters 1 through 12, and it's called the Book of Signs. Um, what do you think that means? The Book of Signs. Yeah. His miracles. Yeah. The, the, the signs that are pointing to who Jesus is. It's the events and the public signs, the miracles that um, convey, that show Jesus' identity, who he is, right? Who is this guy is the question that's being answered uh, in, in the Gospel of John. And the answer is, of course, he is Messiah. Uh, he is the Christ. So in the book of signs, in the first 12 chapters of the Gospel of John, um, Jesus reveals his glory. And remember, we talked about this yesterday, that it kind of came in stages um, from, from this first miracle that's recorded, the wedding at Cana, to the resurrection. Uh, and I think you can see the progression there, right? I mean, turning water into wine, ooh, that's pretty cool. But raising yourself from the dead, you know, that's a that's a whole different level. So, um, so in the the book of signs, in those first twelve chapters, Jesus reveals, his glory. and then the second part of, of John is called the book of glory, and that is chapters thirteen through twenty one. And the primary focus um, of those chapters uh, is um, his glorification, Jesus' glorification via the cross and the empty tomb. So his death and his resurrection. Uh, and in the book of glory, in those chapters, Jesus receives glory from God. So in the first 12 chapters, um, he reveals his glory. And in the last, however many chapters, uh, uh, Jesus receives glory from God. I want to point out, and we'll point this out again, that nearly half of the book of John is the very last part of his life, the last week or so of his life, comprises. It's like we go through kind of at a... a, a a fast pace to the, 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 the wedding at Cana, then we're going to have the discussion with Nicodemus, and then we're going to have the woman at the well, and we're going to have the feeding of the 5,000, and we're going to be going through these things that Jesus is doing, and then it, at 13, it kind of stops, and it slows down. And, and uh, we see um, a lot fewer things going on, uh, but really, really important things um, that are happening. So um, this is um, kind of based on John 1.5, which is the, it is the gospel of John in microcosm. If, if you had to, uh, to pick a verse in John that says this is the, the crux of the gospel of John, it would be this. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Um, that's what John is telling us. The light, Jesus shines in the darkness, but the darkness, Satan, cannot, will not, ever. Jesus, 100%, all the time. Jesus, even when it seems blue, even when it seems otherwise. Jesus. And that's the hope that we can live with um, every, every day. So uh, so we have the book of signs, we have uh, the book of glory, uh, and the book of signs describes how the light shines in the darkness. The book of glory shows or tells how the darkness attempts but fails to overcome it, overcome Jesus, the light, he is the light. Um, so the first sign is this sign that we've been talking about. So because John calls the miracle at Cana, the first sign of Jesus, 
Um, it is believed that this portion of John's gospel recounts the very beginning of his public ministry. And that would make sense because uh, just before this in John 1, he called his first disciple. So this is very, very early. This, this miracle took place very, very early in Jesus' ministry. Um, and uh, this probably takes place chronologically before any of the ministry were counted in the uh, synoptic gospels in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is probably uh, um, in, in terms of, of, a, of a time um, a timeline is before anything uh, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, we can't know that for sure, but but it's probably true. So we're going to talk about this wedding a little bit. Uh, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Oh, by the way, this is the NIV. Uh, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. So here's the problem, and it's a big problem. Um, there's no wine. The wine is gone. And that could have led, as I've told you, to a lawsuit um, for not providing what was needed. Needed At very least, at very least, um, it would have brought shame on the couple and their family. And in a shame culture, that's a big Most Eastern cultures are, like, this idea of shame is the worst thing that can happen. We lived in Korea uh, for two years, and uh, we um, brought back with us to the United States, not with us, but we, we, we sponsored both our cook uh, and his family to come to the United States, and our, it's called hospital, why is it, maybe is the best one, and his family to the United States. And I, and I remember when my sister, my it was clear that my sister, my older sister, uh, would be marrying her now husband. Um, and uh, and uh, Mr. Chong, our cook, cornered Steve uh, and had this long talk about how how is he going to give. He called it satisfaction. Of satisfaction. Like, how are you going to satisfy her? How are you going to? You don't want to bring shame on this family. The worst thing you could possibly do is bring shame on your family. And so, in a shame culture, to run out of wine was a big deal. I'm going to try and give you a picture of this idea. Uh, I forgot to put the, the video up, but I'll go do that real fast. I'm going to pause this so that YouTube doesn't tell me I can't um, put this on YouTube because of so. Um, I will uh, pause this now. And um, so um, I forgot to. Uh, so he is redefining his relationship because he is no longer under Mary's authority. So Jesus has to, in a sense, put a wall between himself and his mother uh, because he can no longer take orders from her. Or from anyone else, for that matter. His only concern is the will of God, his Father. That is his only concern. He obeys God. God's because you see, Mary, just like everyone else on the face of the planet, had to come to Jesus as her Savior, not as her little Mary's as well as the world. Can you, I want you to imagine, I know that you can't really because none of you are parents, but, um, but can you imagine how hard this was for Mary? This little boy that she raised, um, and, and he's basically saying, I'm, I'm not the only one. I don't have to do what you ask me. I think that would have been really hard for uh, me. I know how hard it has been to let go of my own children. 
and and they're not quite convincing. But then this is my kind of my saying uh, that I keep telling myself. They grow up. I think it's and I don't really have much say in that. And that's the way it should be. We want our children to grow up and be financial adults. Uh, and they have to be able to that Mama doesn't mama has to be a mommy after the girl. I know none of that makes sense to you. Um so um yeah, it's been hard. It had to be infinitely more difficult for Mary to let go of Jesus. And he says to her, basically, why do you involve me? Literally, it's it's a Hebraic idiom. And literally, if you if you translate it, it, it says, What to you, what to me and to you. What to me and to you. Um and it, it basically means, how does this concern us both? Or what do we have in common? So Jesus is declaring here at the very beginning of his ministry, his public ministry, that he is completely free from any kind of human advice, agenda, or manipulation. He will do what the Father says he will do, and nobody will deter him from doing it. And then he says to his mother this puzzling thing. My, uh, my time has not yet come. Now, the better translation for that word is hour. And that word is this Greek word, hora. And you need to get to know this word because we're going to see it over and over again um, in John. In John, it refers to the hour of Jesus' glorification. And Jesus' glorification was his death on the cross and his resurrection. Um, and, um, and so uh, he, uh, he is, it's, I, I think in John here, it's something that's called a prolepsis. You're, you're throwing out a theme that will come back later. Um, and, and I think that's, what John is doing here, that he records that. I, I believe Jesus said it, but, uh, but that he's, he's referencing a theme that will be developed. And so this is the first time in John, but it is not the last time in John that we will hear Jesus say, the hour, my hour has not yet come. And he will say that a number of times. And then when we get, I think it's John 12 or 13, or 14, somewhere, no, not 14, uh, 12 or 13, and, and, and he's going to say, my hour is gone. So we're going to hear, my hour is not going to come, my hour is not going to come, and my hour is not going to come, and he's going to say to his disciples, the hour, my hour has come. It's time to die and to rise again as well. So um, Jesus is likely um, picking up on the symbolism of wine and saying that the, that the time for him to provide abundant wine has not yet arrived. Now, let me explain that. In the Old Testament, obviously there is stuff about the about the Messiah in the Old Testament. And the picture in the Old Testament of Messiah is that he will bring a banquet that is, is filled with joy uh, and abundant food and abundant wine. And that is the picture of Messiah. Is that going to happen? Yeah, it's a picture of heaven. Right, and he is going to provide that, uh, and so he's saying that's not. It's not time for that. Yet. It's not time for me to, you know, to to show who I am, and that it's not time for me, uh, time for that bank, that heavenly banquet. Um, but uh, and so I that I think this is the whole point. Who is this guy? He's the he's the one that's going to bring an, an abundant banquet, with an abundant. Abundant, uh, and and uh, again, John is asking that question: Who is Jesus? He is Messiah. He is the one foretold in the New Testament. So Jesus is not refusing to act, to act, and obviously Mary didn't interpret it that way um, because 
the next thing she says is do whatever he tells you to do. Um, so he may be saying that he will act even though his time, his hour has not yet. His time to be glorified has not. But this time to be in his ministry has. And Mary probably didn't really understand it all, um, which is another common theme in John, misunderstanding. Uh, but uh, but she trusts him, and that's that's important. Uh, we're going to move forward here to John twelve. Um, and this is this is kind of this is kind of odd because it, it says now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. Greeks just means non-Jews, Gentiles. Okay, uh, so these came to Philip. So these Greeks, we don't know how many there were, more than one, uh, came to Philip who was from Bethsaida in Galilee and said to asked him, "Sir, we wish to see Jesus." Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be born. So this is the first place where we see Jesus saying, the hour has come. And why the Greeks coming to see him triggered that? Who knows? We'll talk about it more uh, when we get there. So let's talk about the solution, and we've been through this pretty thoroughly now, um, but let's talk about the solution uh, just a, a, a little bit. So uh, he tells the servants to get the water jars and then take those water, fill the water jars and then take them to the master of the feast and it's the best wine ever uh, at the feast. Uh, and then at the end of this uh, story, it says, this, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So that word sign is a really important word also in John. It is sem, sorry, that's an M, sem, eon. I think that's how it's, how it's, uh, oh no, it's E-I-O-N. There you go. Semion, that looks like it. Um, and it's another important word in John, this idea of signs, and this is the book of signs. And the use of that word is intentional, um, I believe, um, because he could have used a word meaning miracle or mighty work, but he chose sign. He chose semion. Uh, he chose sign because a sign is more than a display of it raw power or awesomeness. It, it's a new revelation of God. In other words, God is, when, when we see this word sign, we know that God is doing something new. That God is doing something unusual. Um, and like a sign, this miracle points to something. You know, when, you, when you're driving on the interstate, uh, and you're not sure where you're supposed to go, you're looking at the signs. Where's the exit for, you know, the North Freeway? Where's the exit? And that sign leads you to something. Uh, and, and, it, and it guides you to where you want to go. The miracle at Cana is a sign pointing to Jesus' identity, to who Jesus is. And it is a picture of, the, of another way that is described in Revelation, the wedding banquet of the bridegroom, Jesus, his bride, the church. And so this is a, this is a, a, a picture of that abundant provision in a future uh, banquet, a future wedding banquet. And that, and that provision, especially of wine, that time, that hour has not yet come. But this miracle is a sign saying, it's coming. It will happen. This is proof that there will be another wedding banquet. Jesus used the picture of a wedding banquet a lot in his parable, parables. And he referred to himself as the bridegroom and the church as his bride, as did Paul use that same language. What a perfect place to announce, to reveal the revival 
or excuse me, the the the, the, uh, the um, the arrival of the Messiah happened. But there's more. Something new is being revealed. Uh, the purification rituals are being replaced. No longer will purification with water be needed. Because Jesus is going to provide purification. With his death on the cross. And now there's replacement in this passage not only the purification rites but the entire system will be replaced when Jesus dies and rises again Jesus is the new wine check this out in Mark 2 now, the, now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting and people came to, to, and said to him why did John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it. And the new from the old, and the worst hair, a worst hair is made. And no one puts new wine in the old wine skins. If he does, the wine, wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But the new wine, new wine is for fresh wine skins. Here's what Jesus is saying. There's something completely new happening here. Jesus is the new wine. Um, and, and in and through Jesus, the entire system of how a sinful people connect with a holy God is being replaced and being renewed and being restored. I love this quote from one of my very favorite um, theologians. The story of Cana, therefore, is far more than a story about a wedding and some wine. It is a story that carries remarkable symbolism for the Jews and their Messiah. Moreover, it is a story that makes a sweeping, makes sweeping commentary on the world into which Jesus is coming. They have no wine. It's not simply a comment by Mary about the panic of the wedding's host. It is a theological statement about the Judaism that is now meeting its Messiah in his first, very first meeting. Jesus is the answer to the problem. And, uh, and this is all about who he is. Um, it's not a story about some wine. It's about a story about who he is, as is every story. So in this miracle, the glory of Jesus meets the purpose of John. Um, and we've read about the purpose of John. Uh, this, the first of his signs, Jesus did in Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. And here is his thesis. These were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son. John told this story for the same reason he told every story, that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ. And we would believe in So, I'm going to make sure I got that. I was curious if, so the water that they uh, used, Jesus used to turn into the wine, not, not only was it dirty because people stuck their hands in it, it was also considered a uh, I don't know if it would have been because it was part of a ritual. Okay. So but, I don't think it would be considered unclean, right? Like physically, because people would get their dirty hands in it and stuff? Well, they wouldn't drink it, that's for sure. Uh, I don't know if it would be technically, technically ritual. I'm curious if that, was, uh, if that was possibly supposed to be representative of uh, Jesus taking. Unclean, like, sinners, or like dirty water, and then putting it into uh, in, in that culture would have been something that was ritually clean. that was ritually clean and uh, yeah. pure. I don't so know. I was wondering if that was like representative of that. Yeah, I don't know, but yeah, it is possible. Uh, I don't know for sure. But, yeah, it's entirely possible. All right. Okay. Uh, hand in your uh, in search uh, questions, please.